Hi everyone, I'm uh, Dan Heidenga. I work for IBM. I work on IBM's Java Virtual Machine implementation called J9. I'm talking today, uh, doing a joint talk with Brian, and we're talking about JVM bridge methods and the path that we're not taking. So this is our legal disclaimer, of course. We've seen lots of these this weekend. So the talk is going to talk a little bit about uh, sort of the history of bridge methods, where they came from, why we have them in the language, we're going to look at how this interacts with the new features being added in JSR 335, uh, Lambda expressions, and then we're going to look at sort of the implementation spectrum and where we ended up with. So we got this lovely quote here, today's problems are courtesy of yesterday's solutions. So we've all written code somewhat like this at one point in time. It's a covariant uh, override. We've got a superclass that has a a method that returns its type. We have a subclass that returns a more specific type, and we override this. Well, if we go back to Java 1, you can't compile this. It's illegal. So we move up to Java 5. Suddenly, this becomes legal. It does exactly what you think. We've all written this code. You know, we have an instance of uh, dog, and we call get animal, and it returns an instance of dog. Yes. You know. Very simple. So what's going on here? I'm a JVM guy, so the first thing I do is I go back to the JVM spec and say, you know, how does this work? Well, we've got the signatures uh, shown here. For each of these, it's some nice Java P output. So, you know, dog is a subclass of animal. Good, we've got the first check. Uh, they're both named get animal. Good, we've got the same name, but the descriptors are different. So to the JVM, these are completely unrelated methods. Well, okay, so you know, why does the language say they're the same thing? Well, language says they're the same thing because the language decides to help us. So Java C generates uh, what we call a bridge method. This is an extra method that uh, has the right signature that knows how to re-dispatch re from the, uh, uh, the superclass's signature to the actual subclass's signature. So it knows how to say, you called animal, get animal, expecting to get back an animal, I know how to re-dispatch to the you know, special version that returns a dog. Um, note that this is a compile time artifact. It gets generated by Java C. It ends up in your class file. OK, so let's go back to our JVM spec. We've got this you know, definition vaguely of what a bridge method actually is. It's something that gets generated at compile time. Um, it's marked as synthetic. Um, it bridges between the JVM's type system and the Java the Languages type system, and they're, you know, they exist in your class file. So I go search the latest uh, JVM spec for where this gets mentioned. There's three occurrences outside the table of contents. It tells us that there's you know, a, a flag for methods that we can mark them as bridge. It tells us that it's you know, got this bit pattern and it's generated by the compiler. And it tells us that you can also mark interfaces with bridge which basically says, again, the JVM knows nothing about this. This is just some random bit. It's just some extra piece of information we carry around for the language. So what do these things um, look like in practice? Um, a lot of the time, they're a straightforward bridge from one to the next. Sometimes you get a toll bridge. Um, this is particularly true for cases like generic erasure where you end up needing some check casts on your arguments to make sure that you're still type safe. So, um, right, so where do these come from? They come from the fact that the language semantics are different than the VM semantics and the fact that we want to delay these linkage decisions till runtime. If we decided to do something clever here, we could have uh, copied the code from one to the other um, generated the method twice, uh, used invoke statics. We could have, you know, there are other cheats we could have done, but we wanted to delay things as far as possible to runtime. Um, and it's worth mentioning here that, you know, bridge methods are something that came in in Java 5. So these are not new features in any case. Now, unfortunately, you know, any great feature like this starts to leak through. Um, so the big hammer of Java 5 was we're going to erase stuff and lie to the VM. Okay, you know, we can do that. Um,
But doing this has some costs. It breaks the one-to-one -one correspondence between source code and class file. So now you've got one artifact in your source code and you've got two artifacts in your class file. Um, this starts to leak into things like stack traces. So if you see the example of stack trace I've got there, it claims that you have a method on line one of your source file. Unless you have written some rather disgusting looking Java code, you do not have a method on line one of your source file. Um, as I said, you know, this is just a bit that it leaks through. So now you've got this uh, extra API on reflect, so you can ask if something's a bridge method, but what does that tell you? It doesn't really tell you anything. It tells you that, you know, at some point in time, somebody believed this was meant to bridge. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Um, the fact is that if you're generating your own classes, as lots of you do, you can mark whatever you want as a bridge, you can mark whatever you want as synthetic. That's your call, it doesn't really mean anything to the VM. And you know, JVMTI now can be exposed to these things, so you can actually take something that was supposed to be a bridge, do some agent transformations, and break the language semantics. Not great. So let's look at a couple other ways that these things leak. Um, so here we've got code in two maintenance domains. The code on the top is um, you know, your web server or some JDK code. The code on the bottom is what you know, your user or you would write. So we've got this abstract class callback. It's got a method. Um, we've got, sorry, a subclass of it called C. It provides a method string uh, that returns a string called callback. And we've got some test class on the top that instantiates a new one of these. So we originally just have the code in black. And you know this looks like a stupid example. But realistically, the test class is going to be something that takes a listener or some kind of callback object, um, anything where you'd register that kind of object. So later on, we come along and we say we're going to add, um, in the top maintenance domain, this new method to our abstract class. It returns an object. Um, also named callback, so we've added you know, what looks like a covariant uh, override, except the fact that we've added it later, so it's technically a contravariant underride. Um, and then we go to call it here, and we would expect that when we call it, we're going to get C. We don't. What we actually get here is an abstract method error. Has anybody actually run into this case in practice? Okay, that's uh, you know quite a few more people than I would have expected. You know, <laughs> I expected that nobody would ever have seen this. <laughs> yeah, Re Re Remy doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> so if we look at our next example, we've got three classes. Um, the hierarchy is class foo at the top. We've got bar who extends foo, and then we've got zoo who extends bar. Um, we've got a method that's going to bridge here, and it does a supersend. Um, so note that, of course, the guy on the bottom returns a string. His super implementation returns an object. So if we want to see, you know, what does Java C give us for this, we get the following bytecode. I don't expect anybody to actually read this. Just note that um, we get our invoke special here, and we get our synthetic bridge method there that uses invoke virtual. So we run this code, and we get a call stack that's going to look like that. So our initial call at the bottom here calls using object, so we call our bridge method. It redispatches to the guy with a string. He does his invoke super, um, sorry, his invoke special, calls up the hierarchy, we get foos m. You know, looks great, um, exactly what you would expect. So for some reason, I decided I really like this code. And later on, I come back and I recompile bar. And I push the implementation of the bridge method or the covariant, the covariant override up into bar. So now I've got this code duplicated in both bar and zoo. Worked great. You know, why wouldn't I? I compile this again. And you know, again, there's lots of byte code. It looks almost identical. The only difference is who I'm doing the invoke special against. So I would expect, um, I'm running through this fairly quickly, so I'll slow down for a second. Um, right? The only difference here is the invoke special instructions. The rest of that bytecode looks identical. So you would expect fairly similar behavior when you go to run this. Well, not quite. 
um, your stack ends up looking, you know, starts off the same. We call zoo.m our bridge. He calls the uh, bridged method returning string. He does his super send against the object signature, and that hits the bridge in bar. So what this guy does, though, is he doesn't invoke virtual again. Now the receiver we have is still an instance of zoo. So that lovely invoke virtual calls back down here again, and we do zoo.m, OK? Which doesn't invoke special, which ends up back here in this bridge method, which doesn't invoke virtual, which ends up back here again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And we get this lovely stack overflow. <laughs> right? <laughs> Which, of course, is full of line numbers that don't exist. This has been in the platform for 10 years. Has anybody ever hit this? Yes. Okay, more of you. Yep. <laughs> that would fix the stack overflow. I'm uh, not sure you'd be happy with the result. So we end up with exactly the same problem with generic substitution. Um, welcome to erasure. So this gets erased, and the bridge method at the bottom. This is the case where you get the check cast to make sure that the uh, incoming arguments have the right type. So, well, why am I spending so much time on Java 5 features? <laughs> well, JSR 335 Lambda Expressions adds uh, default methods. So all of the world's code is locked up in hash map and array list. Um, and we're adding these great lambda expressions, so we want you to be able to use them on your collections. But Java believes in binary compatibility, and that means I can't add methods to interfaces or I'm going to break everybody. Well, OK, that sucks. So you want to use lambda expressions. We're going to have to have this new collections hierarchy. We'll have collections two. Anybody who wants to use these things can use the new hierarchy, and away we go. Well, that means maybe in 15 years, most of my customers are going to be able to actually use it because it'll take them that long to, to uh, actually transition things across, right? I, if all your code uses collections and I need to give you collections too, it's going to take you a long time to rewrite lots of code. You may have code you don't have source for anymore, and now you're stuck in the old world. Well, I don't really want to be there, so we need some way that we can take code that exists today and evolve it. Um, The other option we've used here in the past has been these garbage classes. You have Java Util Collection, and so we add Java Util Collections with an S, and we stick a bunch of static methods there, and these help you to get you know, functionality we couldn't give you in the interface. But now you have to know to look in two places, and it, it uglies up your code, and it's a nuisance to maintain. So the actual solution from the 335 expert group is to allow interface methods to have code in them. Um, these are default implementations, and uh, if you don't have the right implementation, you get the default. So now we can evolve our existing collections classes. Um, so what do these look like? They're just basic bytecode. The only you know, real difference here is that it's a body and an interface, and the method has to be marked with that default keyword at the front. Um, Yay, you know, we don't need this garbage class anymore. We can actually put the implementation right where you want it. It's on collection. Um, two neat things about these are that they're declaration site. So it's up to the API maintainer to add them. Um, so the guy who owns Java Util Collection can add extension methods to it. Nobody else can. Um, and the other neat thing is that they're virtual. So collection can define its own version, and somebody who implements collection can define a better version for their particular, um, their particular implementation. So you're not stuck with the single default decimal behavior. You can provide the best implementation as you get there.
So what this shows is that you know, the, the byte codes for this are exactly what you would expect. It's just byte code. The only kind of interesting thing here is that you end up with a lot of invoke interfaces. Not a problem. So, you know, interfaces have multiple inheritance. So how does this actually work in practice? Um, we've come up with sort of three basic rules for dealing with this. These are the language level rules. Um, so basically the first rule is if there's an implementation on the class hierarchy, we take that in preference to anything from the interface hierarchy. Um, if there are two methods in the interface hierarchy and there's a uh, parent-child relationship between them, we take the most specific one. And finally, if there's two from, if there's no single specific method, um, we give you a compile time error. We make you choose. So what do these actually look like? So in our first example here, um, class C, if he calls M, is going to get the implementation from A. Anything on the class side wins. So we can ignore the implementation in the interface hierarchy. Here we've got um, two interfaces that extend each other. Class C implements both of them. And the <coughs> M it's going to get is the one from I, because there's a relationship here. So we can only take the most specific one. And then here we've got um, two interfaces. They're unrelated. And what we end up when we try to compile this code is we get an error. And so this kind of brings us back to bridges. Um, and at this point, Brian. Uh... All right. So, so um, this, you know, the, the title of the talk was "A Road Not Taken." Um, in fact, the, it's really there are two roads that were not taken. Where we went a fair bit of the distance down two different implementation strategies before we settled on on the uh, the final uh, approach for how it is that we're going to implement default methods in Java. So I, I think you know we thought this was a good tale of. Uh, Nothing is obvious. The obvious solution is very often wrong. And you know, the experience we had here with the Java language is very uh, similar to a lot of the experiences that uh, you know, Paul described yesterday for, for Scala, that you start out with these uh, you know, very, very ambitious, uh, well-intentioned uh, ideas about how to evolve the language. And then you kind of run slam into reality and uh, into assumptions that were made earlier. So uh, one, some of the big assumptions that uh, constrained the development of this language feature uh, you know, were ones that, that, that Dan mentioned. One is the commitment to dynamic linkage, uh, and the other is our uh, very strong commitment to compatibility. And the two of these interact in a uh, sort of unfortunate way. Uh, so uh, we started out thinking, OK, this is going to be easy. Uh, you have default methods in the interface. Uh, at class load time, when you're building the vtable, you inherit everything from your superclasses. And then if there are any empty slots left in the vtable, then you go search the interfaces and inherit them down. And we got a fair bit along the way to, you know, towards implementing this before we discovered that uh, we were going to have to deal with the problem of bridge methods. And this was a kind of, you know, oh crap moment uh, for us you know, for a while when we realized that, oh, this is going to be more complicated uh, than we thought because uh, all of the corner cases for um, covariant overrides and generic substitution and all the other cases that bring up bridge methods have to do with separate compilation. And this is a language feature that specifically invites separate compilation. I'm going to extend an interface like list, and then the list maintainer is going to add more stuff to it that I don't know about, and I don't want to have to recompile my code. So I'm supposed to pick up those methods uh, without knowing about them. And so we're kind of putting our, our head in the lion's mouth here uh, by uh, walking into the situation where a lot of these corners uh, start to happen. So as it turns out, uh, you know, interface methods, they can have covariant overrides as well. They can have generic substitution, so they need bridges too. Uh, and if these uh, bridge methods are being added to a class after it's been compiled, because they didn't exist at the time it was compiled, whoever is adding those methods, whether it's the VM or the class loader or, 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 or whatever it is, also has to get the, get the bridges um, into, the, um, you know, in, into the class as well. So the big question, how do we implement that? 
So here's an example uh, where bridge methods would be needed in interfaces. So imagine we were going to add a method on uh, collection that, um, you know, that gave you an unmodifiable version of that collection. Uh, so we have a method unmodifiable and it returns a collection and list extends collection and we want the unmodifiable method on list to return a list, not a collection. So perfectly reasonable thing to do. Um, and meanwhile, you know, you have a list, you cast it to a collection, which is allowable, and then you invoke the unmodifiable method on it. Uh, and what's going to happen here is the signature uh, that, 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 that gets into the bytecode of the client site is going to encode the signature for the collection version of this. But that's not the method we want to call. We want to call this method. So uh, just as, um, you know, just as we have this problem with, um, with classes, we need some way of, um, you know, uh, of uh, making sure that if you call the collection signature um, on a list, it gets vectored back to the, the list version. So, okay, uh, we could have done the same thing we, um, you know, we, we, we did with, uh, with bridge methods and classes. We were hoping we could do better. So, um, you know, let, let, let's, uh, let, 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 let's look at the, the, um, the wrong ways we went before we, uh, we, we ended up deciding on, a, um, deciding on a final translation strategy. So, you know, here, here's an example uh, of how this is meant to be used. Uh, you have a class that implements an interface, and then at some point after the fact, somebody adds a default method to that interface. And in this particular case, this is just like the contravariant underwrite example that Dan gave earlier, where uh, these two methods are really the same method. This one's overriding this one. And if we were compiling everything all at once, uh, the compiler would figure that out and insert the bridges for us. But uh, given that the intent is that we're going to be able to recompile the interface without making you recompile all the, the subtypes, um, you know, we have to do something extra here. So, um, you know, if, if someone, you know, if we just did the naive inherit the signatures, you know, in, in, the, uh, in the obvious way, uh, you'd be building the V table for C. You'd say, okay, C has a method called M returns string, and it inherits a method called M that returns object, and they would look like two different methods, and if you call it with the wrong signature, you would end up over here instead of over here, which is not what we want. Okay, so uh, one obvious way that we could have implemented this is to make invocation sites for default methods use invoke dynamic. And in some sense, this is the obvious answer, right? I mean, here we have a, a problem which is basically adding new la linkage rules to the language. We have this big hammer labeled uh, language definable linkage semantics called invoke dynamic. Why wouldn't we use it, right? Uh, because this way, you, um, you, know, you do an invoke dynamic, and then all of the information you need is present at runtime. The bootstrap can look at the class hierarchy, inf hierarchy information and figure out, yes, I'm supposed to be calling this one, not this one. You don't have to worry about separate compilation because all the information is there. So it seems like it, an obvious choice. This is new linkage rules. Invoke dynamic is our new linkage hammer, match made in heaven, except that our commitment to compatibility got in the way. So we wanted it to be a compatible thing to take an abstract interface method and add a default to it. Uh, so that you know, maybe you want to pull up the implementation from uh, an abstract class up into the interface. And existing client code that calls that method should still work. So if we did that, um, so, you know, imagine in this, in this situation, we had I already had an M method that was abstract, and later we add to it, um, you know, a, 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 a body, making it a default method. If we were calling abstract methods with invoke interface and default methods with invoke, ver uh, invoke dynamic, then when we make this transition, we're going to get a linkage error because uh, it's going to be look. At a, we're, going to, we're going to say invoke this with invoke interface. It's going to look for an abstract method. It's not going to know the linkage rules, um, and and we're going to have a problem. You, you can patch invoke interface to invoke dynamic. Of 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 of, of course. <laughs> Yes, we, of course, we could rewrite the VM, we could change the VM semantics. The idea of using invoke dynamic is supposed to be you can provide your own linkage semantics without, the VM, without having to change the VM. And in this case, it, it failed that test, right? That we wanted to provide these linkage semantics, but we had a compatibility constraint that meant that, uh, you know, because we had legacy code that was using invoke interface, we were, uh, we were out of luck. I mean, yes, so we, of course, we could patch invoke interface, but that's, um, that, that was not the non-invasive solution we were hoping this was going to be. 
Um, so, and, and, and we, we certainly didn't want to tell people, you have to recompile your whole world. So th this was a sort of frustrating uh, experience of, we thought we had the right tool, but our requirements got in the way, and, uh, and it turned out not to be a, a suitable tool. Um, so yes, we could teach Invoke Interface, had to handle defaults and bridging, but um, you know, now we're pushing this you know, in, into the VM. So OK, this, this road didn't work. So um, you know, let, let, let's look at our next, uh, our, uh, our next approach, which is exactly as, as, as Remy suggests. Change the semantics of Invoke Interface and Invoke Virtual. So at first, we thought, Oh, that's, uh, that, that's crazy. We don't want to do that. And then one of our um, you know, VM wizards pull, pulled together an implementation so quickly that we thought, well, maybe this is not as bad as we thought. Uh, so uh, and, you, know, you should always be skeptical of something that comes too easy. Uh, so uh, so, he, so yeah, to summarize where we are here, uh, we need to have bridge methods or an equivalent mechanism. And the language doesn't actually require bridge methods. This is just the mechanism that we've chosen to bridge between the language type system and the VM type system. Uh, we can't use invoke dynamic. We have to use invoke virtual and invoke interface to preserve compatibility. Um, and we still have all of these cases uh, where, with separate compilation where um, you know, we have uh, potential holes that things are, are, you know, are going to fall into. So our next thought is, let the VM do this. Have the VM generate bridge methods. Um, you know, the VM, again, has all the information at runtime. So um, you know, we have a, you know, a complete view of the world. Um, and the existing client code just works, right? And we did actually get this working. And we got it working well enough that we were actually convinced this was a good solution for a while. Uh, we did have to teach the VM about generics because the VM had to do uh, generic inheritance analysis to figure out when it was looking at the signatures that it had to, um, had to match up in the V table, it had to figure out, is this thing that returns object a different method or a bridge for this other method? Or is it a which of these methods is it a bridge for? So it had to do the generic analysis, which we did. Um, and uh, that, you know, mostly, mostly worked. Um, until we tried to specify it. This is why you should always specify things, right? Uh, uh, you know, yesterday, Jan Vitek was talking about the R community uh, was, is highly skeptical of the value of specification. You know, they just like code that works. Well, we had code that worked. And uh, you know, so we bashed our heads against specifying this uh, for quite a while. And uh, eventually, uh, we came to a point where uh, Dan had been working on it for several weeks and said, you know, I've been working on this all week. Um, and I'm actually farther away at the end of the week than I was at the beginning of the week. And that was a pretty bad sign. Uh, uh, so uh, when we actually got to the point where we were going to try to specify how this worked, it was, it was complete Swiss cheese. Uh, and because you were asking the VM to guess, you, oh, there, there, you ended up in situations where the VM had to guess, is this thing a bridge for this or not? Um, uh, were these two methods that have the same name, uh, are they bridges for each other or are they two unrelated methods? We don't, we don't know. And, and uh, you know, when, when you combine that with uh, things that can come out of legitimate, you know, se uh, inconsistent separate compilation, there was no set of rules that was going to work. So we backed away from this one as well. Um, and where we ended up was the place where we started out and didn't want to, didn't want to go, uh, which was uh, to do the same thing for interfaces that we did for classes. So in some sense, this was a little bit of a humbling journey where we looked at sort of the obvious solution and said, we don't want to do that. There's, there are some much better, fancier solutions out there. And then we went and pursued two fancy solutions and felt kind of stupid that we ended up coming back to the, uh, you know, to, 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 to the place that we started out you know, turning up our nose. So uh, what we ended up doing was we looked at the, uh, the pattern of where the Java compiler, a static compiler, um, you know, generates bridges now for classes. And you know, we worked out uh, what, what we would have to do to generate, now that we can generate you know, code into interfaces, to generate bridges into interfaces as well. Uh, so the, uh, the downside of this is all of the brittleness that we have with bridge methods in classes we now have with interfaces as well. On the other hand, you know, D Dan showed you two examples, one mildly bad, one atrociously bad, um, and only the insane person in the audience had ever actually seen, uh, seen these happen in practice. 
um, you know, and the compiler engineers and you know, the pe people whose job it is to deal with these corner cases. But for the most part, we actually don't see these things happen in practice. So we kind of convinced ourselves that if it's exactly as bad as the status quo, which 99.9999% of the people have never seen the bad things happen, um, then having something that is quantitatively worse but qualitatively no worse might actually be better than having it still fail in the class case and do something magic in the interface case where now you have um, you know, two different ways of doing the same thing. Um, so this is what we ended up doing. Um, so you know, if you have a class hierarchy like this, what we do is we say, you know, as you have interfaces i and j, they both have a method called m. Uh, t1 is a subtype of, uh, of t0. So when k inherits from both i and j, it says, aha, OK, I need to generate um, a bridge from t1 to t0 here. And similarly, if, uh, if a, over, uh, a inherits from i, and we have a covariant override, we're generating a bridge here, and then um, you, look at the, uh, you, know, you look at the inheritance, we need a, another bridge here, which overrides this bridge, and everything's good. Okay, so we generate the, uh, the bridges and interfaces at the highest point in the hierarchy uh, uh, where it, it is possible to detect that the bridge is needed. Um, and, uh, and, we end, and then we were able to rip out all the horrible generic analysis code that we had, uh, uh, that we had dumped on the VM here um, and go back to the very simple VM inheritance rules that we had had uh, from the beginning, which was, uh, which was a lot nicer. Yeah? For what case is the bridge from T2 to T1 needed in class C? Let's see. Uh, in class C, because someone might cast C to a J. Um, oh, oh, do we have this backwards? Uh, no, no, you, you, you can call the method via, via J or C. Right, you, ca you cast it to a J, and then someone is going to invoke, um, uh, but, but, but then, then T1 is going to be in the, the signature. Um, Oh, oh, these are backwards, right, yes. This is a bridge from T1 to T2. So if someone casts it to a J, there's going to be a T1 in the signature, and you're going to need a, a, a bridge to, uh, to vector that to the, uh, the implementation that you inherit from A is the one you want. OK, so um, you know, wh where, where we ended up with this um, is, uh, so the, uh, you know, we had some examples uh, in, the, you know, in, the, in the class case where uh, you add a method to a superclass, you don't recompile the subclass, and it turns out that if we had compiled them together, we would have realized that one overrode the other, but we don't because we're not recompiling the subclass and we ended up with an abstract method error. Uh, it turns out that there is an exactly an analogous case now uh, with, it, with interfaces where, where the same thing can happen. So if you, uh, you know, insert here a contravariant underride, um, you know, in, in um, in, in, the, in the class, in the superclass, and don't recompile the subclass, um, and you invoke it through the signature of the, uh, the superclass, you end up at the superclass implementation instead of the subclass implementation. Uh, there is a perfectly analogous failure mode for interfaces. Um, and our reasoning was that because this wasn't a problem, I mean, we've had this problem for 10 years, no one noticed it, it wasn't a problem for classes. Um, that, uh, you know, so that, uh, and if you, if you compile everything consistently, it all works, right? It's, it's only when you, uh, you know, when you, have in, when you have separate compilation that this shows up. Uh, we were willing to tolerate the same behavior, and in some sense, you can consider it uh, almost better that the, both the class version and the interface version fail in exactly the same way, that at least there's some consistency there. I know I'm trying to convince myself of something. Uh, <laughs> So uh, similarly, if you have separate compilation, you know, in, in more complex hierarchies, you can end up with, with uh, you know, with, with, with similar issues. Um, you will, um, uh, you know, if, if, but the behavior that you end up with in these situations is, 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 is actually something that is reasonable from, the spec, from a spec perspective. Because you're saying here that you know, J has an implementation of M, and this, is a, and, and this default implementation will do if, um, if, no one, if no one overrides it. And you end up, through separate compilation, not realizing that C is overriding it. You get the default implementation that was the only one you knew about at compile time. So, it's, so even though it is 
Um, unfortunate, uh, probably the best we can do. Uh, it's it's still consistent with the behavior that you would have expected at compile time. And and this is um, you know th th this is you know one one of the uh, this is sort of what you get when you take the kind of tricks that we added to the type system after the fact, very much like uh, you know, the kind of tricks that Paul talked about yesterday. In Java 5, we added these tricks to the type system after the fact and, and yet wanted to maintain our commitment to dynamic linkage there are going to be um, there. There are going to be corner cases and, and leak through. So, I mean, as much as we all had a good laugh at Paul's expense yesterday, uh, you know, none of us are immune from this. Uh, and uh, you know, so um, you know, as as you extend the type system for a language, uh, and you want to be compatible with existing code that's already out there and existing class files that are already out there, uh, something weird is going to happen somewhere. All right. So. Uh, what can, we, uh, what can we learn from this? Uh, class files are forever. Language features are forever. Uh, so um, you know, when, when, you add, when you add a language feature, you know, it is almost certain to interact with future features that you are going to add and don't know about now. This is, uh, you know, this, this is life. Life is messy. Uh, it might be possible in the future to, to address the problem by moving all bridging into the VM. Uh, in order to do that, um, what we would probably end up wanting to do is to reify, not erase, the information about this method overrides that method according to the language rules and have the VM recognize that uh, the compiler said this method and this other method are the same thing, so I should be willing to like, lump them into an equivalence class and when I see an invocation for one, I can accept that as an invocation for another. Uh, but uh, that's to do that is a lot more than uh, the implementation that we had and threw away. So we might in the future take another running leap at this, get rid of bridge methods, get rid of the leakage, get rid of the, uh, the overhead of the extra call frame, uh, but it, it's an even bigger job than, um, you know, than the version that we thought worked until we tried to specify it and realized that it was full of holes. So uh, today's problems come from yesterday's solutions. Uh, and OK, yeah, questions, Dan. Yeah, so we thought about that. Uh, we actually spent, um, you know, spent some effort figuring out uh, what would that look like, and we concluded that uh, it was not simply uh, a naive matter of toss an annotation onto this thing. Um, and so uh, whatever we would have done now would have effectively been guessing at what we might want to do in the future. It was, uh, and we, look, we looked at a couple of the naive solutions and actually did consider that because at least you know, we'll get a jump start on getting this information into class files. And you know, the, the obvious things were all, in fact, naive. And the takeaway was, gee, this problem is more complicated than we thought. Uh, we also, uh, part of our analysis included, all right, what happens when uh, a class generated by language X uh, you know, wants to override um, a method in a class generated by language Y. How do, how do we uh, figure out which languages override rules? Um, you know, are, are supposed to be uh, honored in the event where they're you know uh, where they're conflicting. It's it's not it, not at all obvious what the answer there is. And so we decided we would be guessing. Why would we generate extra crap into the class file when it's just a guess about something we might use in the future? Jeremy. Um, yeah, yeah, no, 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 it's a, it's a totally fair question. Um, I will argue yes, uh, because I have to. <laughs> I, I would argue yes because it's a failure mode that is a direct analog of a failure mode we've had for since the dawn of time or since the dawn of generics. Um, you know, th that uh, qual uh, qualitatively new and different failure modes are more threatening and offensive to us than new instances of existing failure modes that we've learned to work around. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. That will break anything. Mm -hmm. well, you might not change existing stuff. You might right, well, but that weakens the feature, right? One, 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 of the, um, one of the things that we decided was valuable about the feature of default methods is to take methods that had been abstract, because all interface methods were abstract, and to give them reasonable default implementations where you could. So the example Maurizio gives uh, is there's a default on iterator.remove, which throws unsupported operation exception because almost every implementation of iterator, the remove method just throws unsupported operation exception. Um, and that, uh, that's an example of something that would have broken. And so we would have had to make the decision of that language feature is not one that we find important. And therefore, we're willing to say, yeah, once you made it abstract, it has to be abstract forever. But we didn't want to do that. Yeah, and 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 I'll, I'll, I I think I think that I, I mean if you can right I mean sometimes you can't do that. Uh, I mean the reality is that the you know the kinds of examples that Dan showed with separate compilation they don't bite us that often, right? You know I mean the people in this room are more likely to have seen these things than the Java developers in the wild, and relatively few people in this room had seen them, despite the fact that these have been lurking in the in the platform since Java five with, you know, pretty much unchanged. Well, you can see an example of that case of the exact overflow, and possibly in your second example as well. Uh, couldn't you actually avoid that by using invoke dynamic in the bridge method to invoke exactly the method you want? Yeah, you will fetch a little bit of the ground parameter as well. Yeah. Yeah, so, 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 so when, when this example, when, when the Stack Overflow example had come to light, uh, we looked at, you know, oh, are our bridge methods, are we doing something really stupid in our generation of bridge methods? And we looked at some alternatives like that, and it turns out there are these kinds of holes lurking in almost every one of them. Which, which makes sense if you think about it, right? Because you're, you're, um, you're reifying information into the class file that is out of date by the time it gets, it gets run. And you have an inconsistent view of the world. And so there are assumptions baked into uh, every bridge method about the existence of the method that they're calling. And it's fairly easy to construct, once, once you know to look for these things, it's fairly easy to construct you know, cases that, 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 that could tickle almost any, any of those constructions. I mean, ideally, we'd like to get the bridge methods out of the class files and, and, and entirely. One, one other nasty bit that I forgot to mention um, is, uh, so we have a VM specification. We have a language specification. In neither of these documents do we talk about bridge methods, except you, know, you, you really have to tilt your head and squint and say, oh, yes. But in the white space between these words, the words bridge method appears in very, very, very small type. Right? Uh, they get implied, but they don't, it doesn't actually get said anywhere because there's no specification for the Java compiler. Uh, and there would have to be a specification for the Java compiler uh, if, if we wanted to nail down, this is the kind of bytecode you have to em emit when you encounter this language construct, and we don't have one. Um, and this is one of the things that made it uh, incredibly painful to try to specify this in the VM was that there was no existing specification of how bridge methods worked that we could build on. I think we have time for one more question, Remy. Undecidability. Yeah. Well, there's, there are others. There's un undecidability is another problem. Yeah, it's it's undesirable. There's just no no question about it. Uh, and and it, it's despite the effort that we put into it, we didn't put nearly enough effort into it to feel like we, had, we, we were anywhere close to a solution that we were comfortable burning into this back. So, all right. Thank you very much.